his people are the result of an experiment. Are they a success or are they a failure? Does it matter? Regardless of the condition of their birth, his people have been exiled, discriminated, hunted, and even farmed. There are tales of a promised land where they will find protection, but it all seems futile now. Having seen his whole kind dragged through all matters of hell, his soul is tainted and his heart empty. The endless void of his eyes shows no emotion and no remorse. If he is to be the last one, then he will be the last one. Soon, the whole lands between got to fear the Albinator. This is what I call a toolbox strength build, and the objective is to be ready for anything and everything that the game can throw at us, taking advantage of high survivability, impeccable resource management, and the highest degree of immediate adaptation that you can find, this build is ready for the unknown. This build is ready for the DLC. As always, we will review the stats of the build, the equipment that we use, and of course its applications within the game. Since there is a lot of ground to cover, I have created timestamps in the description of this video in order to make it easier to navigate the content and give you the opportunity to skip straight to the part that interests you the most. Let's get started. This build is hyper-focused for PvE in order to be prepared for the new challenges that the Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC will bring to the table. If you are not sure what build could be the best to take on a brand new DLC adventure, then look no further. You will find that the base of this build takes a lot from another one in the channel called The Last Sentinel. While that build was more focused on jolly cooperation, this one makes a much larger effort in making things easier for the player. By combining the high survivability of a tank type character with resource management, we are able to achieve a beast that will simply refuse to die. We are talking about a character that takes advantage of every single mechanic that Elden Ring gives to the players. We have damage, we have HP, we have defenses, we have incantations, we have status effects, critical hits, stance breaks, self-healing, consumable support, all of it in order to increase the chances of success in beating enemies and bosses that we have never faced before. This is my personal PvE build and I made sure that I put all of my experience into it. This build rewards the player that thinks. This build rewards the player that is ready. To reach this objective, we will be running the following stats. Start the game as a vagabond. This class is the most efficient to reach the required stat block for this build, allowing us to make use of every rune level possible to its maximum potential. As the primary focus of this build is PvE, I have chosen to base it on rune level 150. Finally, this is the stats block that you want to end up with. 60 Vigor, 38 Mind, 30 Endurance, 55 Strength, 13 Dexterity, 13 Intelligence, 13 Faith, and 7 Arcane, plus 4 from the Alvinoric Mask, for a total of 11. There are many ways to reach these stats, you can level up however you feel comfortable. That being said, I do recommend that you take the following path. As soon as you are in the lands between, the first thing to do is get your Vigor to 20. Survivability is more important than damage when you're just starting out a character. The second priority will be to get Intelligence and Faith to 13 each. This will give you access to the most basic incantations that will give you a big support boost throughout the whole build process. Things like Elemental Resistances and Order's Blade will make running through dungeons that much easier. The third priority will be to get Strength to 30. This is the main damage stat of the build. We need to get it up in order to meet weapon requirements and increase our damage scaling. The fourth priority is to get Vigor to 40. This will allow you to survive comfortably throughout the mid-game, letting you focus on your other stats. The fifth priority is to get Endurance and Mind to 20 each. This will increase our equip load, allowing us to use better armor and also increase our FP to cast more support spells and take advantage of more Ashes of War. The sixth priority is to get Strength to 55. This will top off our main stat at the second soft cap, providing us with efficient damage and the ability to use most strength weapons in the game. The seventh priority is to top off Vigor at 60. 
This will put you at our required HP pool, granting you maximum security to withstand the hardest hitting attacks from the endgame enemies. The eighth and final priority is to bring Endurance to 30 and Mind to 38. This will close out our build, giving us the equip load we need and the most efficient FP value possible. Altogether, it will solidify the defensive aspect of the character. So, why do we want these final stats? Allow me to explain. Vigor at 60 because I believe it is the perfect amount of health to survive the hardest hitting attacks of PvE. This will give us a total of 1,900 base HP. It is the second cap for the stat. Going any higher really diminishes your returns, and honestly, I would never go any lower. Mind at 38 because it gives us the most efficient amount of FP possible. This gives us a total of 221 FP, and a max upgrade Cerulean Flask will recover 220 FP. This means that we can use up the whole FP bar and recover it back to full in a single flask. Endurance at 30 because it has been min-maxed in order to let the character use the weapons and armor that I prefer for this build. It is perfected to have 69.41% equip load. If you put any less points, we lose the build. If you put any more points, you are wasting them. Strength at 55 because it is the primary stat of the build. It gives us our damage and it meets the requirements that we need to use the weapons that we want. Dexterity at 13 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. It is already enough to use the weapons that we want and so there is no need to level it up any further. Intelligence at 13 because it is the exact level that we need to use some fundamentalist incantations, particularly Order's Blade. Faith at 13 because it is the level that we need in order to use some basic but very important support incantations that will increase our damage, our defenses and make this character's life that much easier. Finally, Arcane at 7 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not level this up at all. That being said, we are using the Elven Auric Mask that gives us 4 levels of Arcane, bringing us to 11. This is to use Blood Flame Blade. Moving on to the equipment, this is the basic layout of the build. Like we spoke before, the objective with our equipment is to provide high defenses and resource management in order to increase our chances of survival. This is especially important for the DLC since we do not know what we will face and we must be prepared for everything. Starting with the armaments, our weapon of choice is the Heavy Great Stars. For starters, it is a strength type weapon that favors our build, providing us with a fantastic amount of damage. Furthermore, it deals strike type damage, one of the best kinds of damage in the game. There are not that many enemies that resist this kind of damage, and there are actually quite a few of them that are particularly weak to it. For example, the Undead and the Crystallians. Besides this, the Great Star has a special effect that heals us for a total of 1% of our max HP each time that we hit an enemy. Since this build has a high amount of HP, usually between 2600 to 2900, this means that we are able to heal between 26 to 29 HP for each enemy that we hit. In order to make this clear, it is not per attack, it is per enemy hit. If we hit multiple enemies with a single attack, then we will get the 1% healing from each one of them. As for the Ash of War, I choose to use Prayerful Strike. This is my favorite Ash of War in the game. It deals a good amount of damage and it has a huge amount of hyper armor. There are very few attacks in the game that will interrupt this Ash of War. That being said, its best characteristic is the fact that this Ash of War heals us the player for 30% of our max HP for each enemy that we hit. Again, this is per enemy that we hit, meaning that if we hit multiple enemies with the same prayerful strike, we will get 30% HP from each one of them. Also note that this stacks with the innate healing from great stars. The 30% from prayerful strike adds to the 1% from Great Stars for a total of 31% HP healed every time we hit an enemy. The final note about the Great Stars is that it also has innate bleed. Specifically, it has 55 points of bleed application per hit. 
This is not something that we focus on, but it has really good synergy with one of the incantations that we like to use, Blood Flame Blade. This generates an additional source of damage that really gives this build an offensive edge against most types of enemies in the game. For the offhand, I run the Icon Shield. While making this build, I decided that it would be a tank type character, so a Great Shield is a fantastic defensive addition. As such, thanks to its above average level of hardness, it is able to make the most common attacks bounced off of it. This generates opportunities for a counterattack. On top of this, the Icon Shield has a special effect that regenerates our HP at the rate of 3 HP per second. As you will see throughout the guide, HP regeneration is an important aspect of the strategy and this shield fits the theme perfectly. Now, I am sure that you're aware that this shield does not have 100% physical damage blocks. In fact, it only blocks 95% of incoming physical damage. This might sound like a lot of damage is bleeding through, but it is not the case. Between our character's high damage negation and the passive HP regeneration, you will see that this 5% damage that goes through is not really a determining factor. I like the Icon Shield because it gives us all of these benefits while keeping a very manageable 11.5 units of weight. For a Great Shield, this is light and it helps with managing our equip load. One last thing I will say about this shield is to not upgrade it to plus 10. Keep it at plus 9. Upgrading this shield to max does not improve the guard boost, so it becomes a waste of materials. Also in the offhand, I run an incantation seal to help me cast my support spells, particularly those that buff my weapon. In this case, I like to run the Frenzied Flame Seal. This seal has the highest amount of incantation scaling with these stats. That being said, it is honestly not saying much because it is extremely low. This build is not prepared to cast offensive spells. The best part of this seal is that it has a total weight of 0.0 units, and this means that we can use it without it affecting our equip load. This is a very important factor. After all of this is said, you can also use the Dragon Communion seal with this build. It is also weightless at 0.0 units, so it does not affect the build. It is weaker than the Frenzied Flame Seal with a lower incantation scaling, but since this does not really matter, you can choose whichever you prefer. Either one of these will serve the exact same purpose. Like I mentioned before, I prefer the Frenzied Flame Seal in order to get a small bit of additional damage. That being said, the Dragon Communion Seal is much easier to get. With our weapons out of the way, let's talk about talismans. This build has one objective when it comes to talismans, survivability. This means that we want to have a lot of HP, as well as high defense and negation in order to survive some hits. For this reason, we are running the Earth Tree Favor plus 2, the Crimson Ember Medallion plus 2 in order to get the HP values we want, then the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman for increased damage negation, and the Blessed Dew Talisman for some additional HP regeneration of 2 HP per second. This stacks with the Icon Shield that we spoke about before for a total of 5 HP per second passive regeneration that is constantly in effect. With this setup, we will have a total of 2134 HP with a supporting damage negation of 45% that combines with the HP regeneration that we spoke about before. This combination makes the character a true tank capable of withstanding the hardest hitting attacks of the endgame and hopefully those attacks that will be incoming in the DLC. That being said, under no circumstances will this make you immortal. It is just a way to save resources and to improve your chances of survival. Alright, let's talk about armor. In this game, armor is extremely important. This is because this game has extremely good looking armor. Fashion Souls, or Elden Bling, however you prefer to call it, is at an all-time high. For this build, I decided to use one of my favorite armor sets in the game, the Crucible Knight set. Specifically, I am using the altered Crucible Tree Chest piece, along with the Crucible Arms and Legs. The headpiece is the Alvinoric Mask. Besides the fact that this headpiece gives us a total of 4 levels of Arcane to allow us to use Blood Flame Blade, 
I also like how it looks and I really wanted to run a build with it. It is true that this headpiece lowers the amount of HP that our Crimson Flask heals us by 10%, but you will see that this is not an issue for this character. Overall, it generates the image of a really strong Olvenoric that is truly tired of seeing his people get massacred for reasons that are beyond them. Overall, this setup gives us a total of 31% damage negation, which turns into the already mentioned 45% damage negation with the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. It also provides us with 63 poise, which is a very good amount for PvE play. This build is a good example of being able to combine a good looking fashion with some really good stats. I like using this fashion because it is extremely reliable. When it comes to the spirit summon that we will use for this build, I decided that the best choice is the Mimic. Besides the fact that this is my favorite summon in the game, it is impossible to ignore that a Mimic running this build is extremely powerful. With a large HP pool, a great shield and constantly regenerating health, the Mimic becomes the father of all tanks. I have to be honest, I have never seen any enemy kill the Mimic with this build. I can die. The Mimic can even fall off the edge and die to gravity. But again, I have never seen an enemy deal a finishing blow to this unit of a monster. The result is that you have a second character that is just as good at surviving as we are, and this serves to split enemy aggro among the two of us. This means less attacks coming your way, and that means surviving for longer periods of time. Now, in terms of offense, the Mimic does not fall behind. It is using the Great Stars, and that means that it helps us apply Bleed, as well as it helps us break enemy stances. This gets us many opportunities for critical attacks. Also, remember when we spoke about Prayerful Strike? Well, that Ash of War has an AoE effect on the healing it does. So, if we are next to our Mimic, then it can heal us while we heal it. The synergy is perfect and it makes the Mimic and us a dynamic duo that will be very hard to beat. Finally, we have to talk about the support value that this summon has. Later in the video, we will be talking about a set of consumable items that I like to use in order to improve the power of this build. I like to use some pots as well as some defensive consumables. Well, the Mimic can use these as well, providing us with status application as well as some additional HP regeneration. All in all, this summon gives this build a gigantic boost of power, both in offense and in defense. That generates an extremely safe strategy. I look forward to the DLC and finding a boss that can finally take it down. Now, this is a build type that I like to call the Toolbox. I have mentioned it a few times before, but the time has come to understand what this means. It is actually self-explanatory. This build is about having the right tool for the job, and the more tools you have, the more jobs you can do. When you got a job to do and you need a tool, you go to the toolbox. So the principle is to be ready for as many different situations as possible. We can increase our defenses, we can increase our offense, we can even remove annoying status effects. Big enemies, no problem. Groups of enemies, we got it. Undead, undone. There is nothing that this build cannot take care of. In my toolbox, I like to keep a few armaments, a few ashes of war, plenty of incantations, and a few consumables. Now, it is important that you understand that these are my own personal choices. This is my toolbox. The best part about this build is that you can put whatever you want or whatever you need in your toolbox. Hopefully, my choices can inspire you to make your own set of tools. One of the main reasons that I love the Vagabond as a starting class is the fact that it comes out of the box with 13 dexterity. This lets me make any build I want and still be prepared to run the Claymore. This weapon is one of the best in the game and it is in my top 3 of favorites. It has good damage, good speed and a great moveset. It is extremely versatile and, by itself, is already an answer to many of the problems that we face. It gives us access to piercing damage if required, and it provides us with many back pocket ashes of war. 
In this build, I like to run the Claymore with the Fire Infusion because it takes advantage of the strength scaling that we have access to and also provides us with fire type damage. It is always a good idea to diversify damage types just in case we find an enemy that is extremely resistant to strike type damage. As for Ashes of War, the basic one is Lion's Claw for damage, but we can also use Flame of the Red Mains. While this has been heavily nerfed, it still provides a good AoE damage that can help us against crowds. Overall, this is the perfect back pocket weapon. I honestly don't bring it out as much as I would like to, because the Great Start takes care of most enemies. But I always keep the Claymore close to my heart. While I try to make sure that this build is as good as possible in as many situations as possible, it is impossible to be good at everything. This build is extremely good at one-on-one -on -one fights, it has the tools to control the rhythm of battle and to outlast the enemy. That said, if we are forced to fight two or more high priority targets, meaning enemies with a lot of HP or with very fast movement, then we would suffer a bit more. This is immediately resolved by summoning the Mimic. If there is two of us, nothing can stand in our way. That being said, we can't always summon at all times, and in these cases, we need to use our head. That is where the Pulley Bow comes in. We can use this as a ranged attack that can aggro targets one at a time in order to pull them away from each other. This lets us fight them one on one, where this build shines. The bow itself does not do a lot of damage, but we do not really care about that which is needed as a ranged tool to turn bad situations into favorable ones. Always have a bow in your toolbox. It can set off traps, it can pull enemies, and it can solve long-distance problems. It is important. My dear viewer, always have a torch in your toolbox. Dark Souls 2 is a strict teacher and it showed me the huge importance of a torch. It is a source of light, but it is also a source of life. Later on, in Dark Souls 3, those stupid maggot enemies that covered your character in leeches that constantly inflict bleed also taught me to keep a torch in my pocket. Now, in Elden Ring, having a torch is very important when you need a lot of light. Sure, the lamp is great, but sometimes you need more. That being said, I specifically like to keep the sentry's torch with me. During my first playthrough, I had a lot of trouble with the invisible black knife assassin enemies, especially in Ordina. That was hell. Since then, I swore that it would never happen to me again, and the sentry's torch has become a staple in my toolbox. If I need light to explore, it comes out. If I am fighting invisible enemies, it comes out. It will spend hours upon hours in my pocket, but when it is needed, it is a lifesaver. My dear viewer, always have a torch in your toolbox. Stormcaller is a great offensive Ash of War. It provides great damage around the character, helping us deal with crowds. It has many hits that combo together and also manages to keep enemies under lockdown. Now, the most important thing about this Ash of War is the synergy that it has with the great stars. Remember that this weapon heals us for 1% of our max HP for every hit. Also remember that this weapon inflicts bleed on every hit. If we combine these two characteristics with Stormcaller, we get a hurricane of pain that heals us for every hit while it constantly applies bleed to every enemy around us. Every hit on every enemy heals us. Every hit on every enemy applies bleed. The Fall Ash of War attacks a total of 7 times. If all attacks hit, this means that we heal for 7% of our max HP. This is a total of about 185 to 200 HP healed throughout the whole combo. And remember, this is per enemy. If you get 2 enemies locked in the combo, that is double the healing. And if you get 3 enemies locked in, well, you get the idea. The same principle applies to the bleed application. If all attacks hit, it is a total of 385 units of bleed application, and that does not even take into consideration the possibility of Blood Flame Blade. Overall, if you want to be aggressive, this is a very good option for you. In life, 
there is a strategy that we like to call balls to the wall. That is what Prelate's Charge does. It is an unstoppable train of pain that keeps on going as long as the character has FP and stamina. There is no stopping this. Prelate's Charge has the character slam the weapon on the ground and start dragging forward, constantly attacking the enemy. The more you hold the attack, the more it attacks, all while moving the character forward. This Ash of War follows the same strategy as Stormcaller. Every attack heals us for 1% of our max HP, and every attack inflicts bleed on the enemy. Since the attack only ends when you want it to end, it can hit the enemy as many times as you have resources. If you are willing to go all in on this attack, we can heal hundreds of HP and you are guaranteed a bleed proc. And of course, if you are using Blood Flame Blade while doing this attack, then you can probably proc bleed twice or even three times on the same enemy. It is an incredible attack that is perfect for dealing with single targets. It is focused damage that shines in one-on-one -on -one battles. If you are the kind of player that only knows how to move forward, then this is the best way to do it. Gravitas is one of my personal choices for this build because it is a perfect back pocket Ash of War. It does not get used often, but when it does, it comes in clutch. On its own, it is a good Ash of War that provides decent damage and great crowd control. That said, the number one reason why I keep this option handy is the amazing answer that it provides against flying enemies. Generally speaking, flying enemies are annoying and they can pose a significant threat to this character. In order to neutralize this threat, we call upon Gravitas. When activated, this Ash of War creates a force field with considerable range that pulls enemies towards the caster. If the enemy is flying, they will be flung to the ground, staggered, and completely stunned for a few seconds. This gives us enough time to defeat the enemy before it takes to the air again. This is the answer to every single flying enemy. From the simple dragonflies that simply annoy us, to the falcons up at Castle Soul. If it flies, then Gravitas comes out. For this reason, I like to keep this Ash of War in my inventory at all times. It can go on the Claymore, on a second great star, or even on a longsword. It does not matter which weapon, as long as you have it prepared. In this part of the toolbox, I keep the incantations that I use to give this character an edge in every single battle. Some of these incantations provide us a defensive advantage, others increase our resource management, and there are a few that increase our offensive power in key situations. I use every single memory slot with this character and every incantation shines as an answer to a specific problem. Remember, it is all about being ready for the unknown. The list is what you see on the screen. Bestial Vitality, Blood Flame Blade, Order's Blade, Heal, Flame Cleanse Me, Order Healing, Magic Fortification, Flame Fortification, Lightning Fortification, and Divine Fortification. Bestial Vitality is one of the best healing tools in the game because it is one of the most efficient healing tools in the game. This is a regeneration type spell that heals 5 HP per second for 120 seconds. This is a total of 600 HP over the full duration. At the cost of only 18 FP, this incantation heals us for about 33 HP per FP spent. It will be difficult to find a more efficient healing spell in the game. I have found that this incantation is very useful in this build. This regeneration stacks with the 5 HP per second that we get from the Icon Shield and the Blessed Do Talisman. All of this for a total of 10 HP per second regeneration. To put it into perspective, this total regeneration will heal us for 1200 HP throughout the duration of the spell. That is almost 50% of our max HP. As you can see, this would be great to conserve resources. When the DLC drops and we are exploring a new dungeon, there will be a lot of times when we are platforming or just simply looking around. All of this time out of combat is time to regenerate HP. This means that we can save the Crimson Flasks for when they really matter. Bosses. Blood Flame Blade is one of the most important tools that we have to deal additional damage. 
It is a buff type incantation that increases the power of our weapon. Specifically, it provides additional fire type damage equals to 40% of our faith based incantation scaling. For our build, this means an additional 44 points of fire damage. This is not a lot, but it does not matter. The focus of this buff is its secondary effect. This incantation also hits the enemy with a debuff that inflicts 40 points of bleed application over 2 seconds. This stacks with itself every time that we hit an enemy. Not only this, but it also stacks with the 55 point application that the Great Star has. Overall, this makes it the perfect tool for the Great Star that will proc bleed on enemies very easily. Most enemies in the game are susceptible to bleed, so I always have this incantation active, especially if I am fighting high priority targets. Since it only costs 20 FP per cast, it is a very effective way to increase our total damage output. Order's Blade is the best answer that we have against Undead. Personally, I find these enemies annoying. The fact that you have to double tap them in order to defeat them is incredibly troublesome and I have to be honest, sometimes I forget to do so. This incantation fixes this problem for me. Order's Blade is a buff type incantation that gives our weapon additional holy type damage equal to 75% of our faith based incantation scaling. In the case of this build, we get about 82 points of additional holy damage. Once again, this is not a lot but much like we do with Blood Flame Blade, we do not care about this. We are much more interested in the secondary effect that it gives us. On top of the damage, the incantation gives us a 100% damage boost against undead type enemies. That is right, this incantation straight up doubles the damage that we deal to undead enemies. This includes the damage we get from this buff and the natural damage of our weapon. Since the Great Stars deals strike type damage, which undead are generally weak to, the resulting combination is thousands of damage per attack. We are capable of dealing almost 1500 damage with just an R1. But wait, there is more. Order's Blade also prevents any undead from reviving. That's right, no more double tapping. Kill them once and we are done. One incantation? costing only 22 FP fixes the undead problem. Heal is the only healing spell that I use. That said, its purpose is not exactly to heal myself. In fact, I use this spell for one thing and one thing only, to kill revenants. Revenants are one of the most powerful and annoying non-boss type enemies that you can find in the game. They deal incredible amounts of damage and are in constant motion and attack. They teleport around the area and I am sure you know have that one stupid move where they hit you 1 million times with all of their arms in succession. It is very difficult to fight them but fortunately if you do not let them get started on their offense then they become much easier to deal with. In order to achieve this we use heal. Revenants are very weak to holy damage, but they are also extremely weak to healing spells. If you cast a healing spell with an AoE and it catches the Revenant, they will take damage instead of being healed. The amount of damage they take is always the same, 50% of their max HP plus an additional 300 damage. Two spells will always kill them and since the first spell also staggers them, it is very easy to cast two of them back to back the kill. Since the damage is always the same, I like to use heal because it costs the least FP out of all of the AoE heals. If you execute this strategy correctly, then you will be able to defeat the Revenant before it even has a chance to hit you. Furthermore, the DLC might introduce other threats that can be damaged in this way, so it is very important to be prepared. Flame Cleanse Me is one of the most powerful incantations in the game. It provides a fast, cheap way to get rid of poison and most importantly, Scarlet Rot. This should always be in your list of spells. Scarlet Rot is extremely annoying and so is poison. This is especially harmful in Elden Ring because due to the size of the game and all of the exploring that we do, having a damage over time debuff like poison or Scarlet Rot is really bad for your resource management. 
This can become particularly dangerous in the DLC. Since we do not know what we will find, it is important to be able to remove these effects as soon as possible. Furthermore, it is good to note that this incantation deals a very minuscule amount of fire damage to you when you cast it. The damage itself is insignificant, but it is still fire type damage. This means that we can use this incantation to remove the effects of Frostbite, another dangerous status effect. As a result, Flame Cleanse Me becomes an indispensable tool to improve our comfort during exploration. I don't know about you, but I have a feeling that the DLC will bring to the table a lot more death blight. I believe that there will be more enemies or more environments that will inflict this status effect on enemies. Generally speaking, death blight was not a big threat in the main game, so I never felt endangered by it. That said, I think that we are overdue for a death blight swamp, so I choose to be ready. That is where order healing comes in. It is a fast, cheap way to get rid of all Deathblade buildup that we have. If you're in the middle of battle, or if you just finished fighting and you are almost Deathblighted, this incantation will remove the problem immediately. At first, I was skeptical about this incantation. I did not think it was very useful. But after testing it through some battles with those giant worm humanoid enemies, it really makes my life so much easier. And that is what this build is about. Making my life easier easier. It may not be the most useful incantation on my list, but boy am I happy to have it the few times that I need it. The Quartet of Magic Fortification, Flame Fortification, Lightning Fortification and Divine Fortification is what I like to call the Resistance Crew. This is our main tool to counterpick the damage that each of the game's enemies and bosses will do. They provide resistances to magic, fire, lightning, and holy damage, respectively. You should always have one of these active if you want to increase your chances of survival. They are cheap to cast, costing very little FP, and they last a considerable amount of time, taking into consideration how much of a defensive boost they represent. Each of these incantations will leave you with around 50% damage negation against the chosen damage type, depending on what kind of armor you choose to use. Mileage may vary, but it is always a good choice to have these on if you know that the enemy or boss deals some kind of elemental damage. In this case, the more we know, the stronger we can get. Boiled Crab is one of the most useful consumables that we have access to. It increases our physical damage negation by 20% for 60 seconds. Of course, due to the way that Elden Ring calculates damage negation, there are diminishing returns and we do not get the full 20% boost. In this build, we get a total of 11% additional damage negation, bringing us from 45% to a total of 56% for the duration of the item. This may not sound like a lot, but it is huge. Boiled Crab is very easy to get. We can buy as much as we want for only 600 runes apiece. Not only this, but we are able to carry a total of 99 units on us. This means that we are capable of constantly using this consumable on every single fight. Whenever we rest at a site of grace, we are refreshed again to 99 units, and I have found it impossible to use all 99 boiled crabs before hitting the next grace. Overall, this consumable is the bread and butter of our defense boosts. Use it before every single fight. This character requires that you adopt the Frenzied Flame. The reason why I do this is because it allows us to use the Frenzy Flame Stone. This consumable is a stone that you drop on the ground and it generates an AoE aura that heals all followers of the Frenzied Flame for 35 HP per second during a total of 30 seconds. This is a lot of HP regeneration and it stacks with everything else that we use. It stacks with Bestial Vitality and it stacks with the Icon Shield and the Blessed Dew Talisman. All of this together will add up to a total of 45 HP per second regeneration. To put it into perspective, this amount of regeneration will heal us completely from 1 HP to full HP in 1 minute. 
The thing that makes this very powerful is the fact that it only costs 15 FP to use. That is extremely efficient. The only downside is that you have to stay in the area of effect. But honestly, it's not that bad. We only have to be there for a minute. Another good thing though is that when you summon the Mimic, it will also drop these every once in a while. That's great, because we can get the benefit of this healing in the middle of battle thanks to our summon. If you find yourself at the end of a battle and badly wounded, take a break and drop one of these. There is no need to waste a Crimson Flask. Freezing Pots are some of the most useful and easiest to make pot consumables in the game. They are too good to pass up and I always have 10 of these in my pocket. Once you hit an enemy with these, they receive a total of 380 points of Frostbite buildup. On its own, this is usually enough to proc Frostbite on the first pot, but sometimes enemies require two. In any case, Frostbite is a very good status effect that deals some immediate damage equals to 10% of max HP plus 30 on regular enemies, or about 7% max HP plus 30 on bosses. This is already a good bit of damage, but that's not all it does. Frostbite also reduces the enemy's damage negation by 20%, meaning that they will be taking additional damage from every other attack that we do. This debuff lasts for 30 seconds. As mentioned before, this pot is easy to make, requiring only two rhymed crystal buds. We can find about a hundred of them scattered in the northwest part of the consecrated snowfield, so it is easy to farm them and easy to stock up. Use these constantly, as the amount of damage that they provide is really valuable. One last note, the Mimic also throws these when you summon it, giving us free frostbite procs without costing us any resources. Sleep Pots are the final tool in my toolbox and they are very, very good. The sleep status effect is extremely effective at crowd control and the most important example is the Godskin Duo fight. You put one to sleep and then you leave it alone while you fight the other. That said, they are also very good at dominating groups of enemies, giving you time and space to plan the correct attack. They are the perfect tool to neutralize enemy advantages and provide us with tactical superiority. The only downside is that they are difficult to make. They require one mushroom and one Trinus lily. Mushrooms are no problem, but the lilies can be hard to farm. The best spot for me is all the way up at the consecrated snowfield at the northwest by the apostate derelict. Next to this building there are some jellyfish that you can farm and each of them has an 8% chance of dropping a lily. It is painful, but it is worth it. Sleep pots can single-handedly decide fights. And once again, shoutouts to the Mimic. Our boy throws these like a madman. You can definitely tell that he does not have to farm for the materials. And so, my dear viewer, in order to finish the build, I really want to talk about the Flask of Physics and the Rune of the Demigod, as well as how these tools affect our tanking capabilities to increase our chances of success. When it comes to the Rune of the Demigod, we use Morgoth's Rune. This increases our maximum HP by 25%, and it is a basic tool that helps us survive and increase the amount of healing that we can get. As for the Flask of Physics, I like to use the Opaline Heart Tier and the Crimson Spill Crystal Tier. The first one increases all of our damage negation by 15% for 3 minutes, and the second one increases our max HP by 10% for 3 minutes as well. Combining all of these with the tools that we already explained, we can reach some serious defensive numbers. In regards to HP, we have a total of 2134 HP from stats and talismans. If we add Morgoth's Rune, we get 2667 HP. And if we add the Crimson Spill tier, we can top off our health pool at 2,934 HP. This is important because it affects the healing that we get from the Great Stars and from Prayerful Strike. With these numbers, we can heal between 26 to 29 HP per hit with the Great Stars and between 800 and 880 HP with Prayerful Strike. This is a lot of healing. Don't forget that we are also getting some HP regeneration on the side. To put this into perspective, 
1 Crimson Flask plus 12 heals us for 810 HP normally. But since we are using the Alvinoric Mask, this is reduced by 10%. This means that 1 Crimson Flask plus 12 would actually heal this build for about 729 HP. As you can see, we can get much more healing from a single Prayerful Strike than we do from a single Crimson Flask. And it only costs us 20 FP. This is fantastic value. Still, using flasks is important because they are faster and they do not require that we actually hit an enemy. For this reason, it is a good idea to save them for bosses or for when we are in a troublesome situation. Nevertheless, you can see that the flask healing reduction that we get from the Alvinoric Mask is not that much of a problem. We have plenty of healing from other sources. In regards to damage negation, things are also looking very good. This build runs a base physical damage negation of 45% that can be increased to 56% with Boiled Crab and then increased again to 62% with the Flask of Physics. This is a lot of damage negation. Even if it is temporary, it can make most boss attacks feel like a slight breeze against your skin. As for elemental defenses, it is a bit of the same. We get a base negation of about 20 to 25 percent depending on the element which can be increased to about 50 percent with the corresponding resistance incantation and then this can be further increased to about 57 percent with the flask of physics of course all of this depends on which element we are talking about as you can see with the proper setup we can become a true paragon of safety it is all about using the right tool for the right job. This build is the absolute best for me. This is because it fits my playstyle, it fits my desires, it fits my priorities, and in the end, it just favors those things that I like to do. I like to be prepared. I am the type of player that likes to explore and observe the enemy before charging into battle. I like to play it safe and prioritize the survival of my character. Of course, this means that this build might not be a good fit for other players. This is okay. To me, this guide was a bit more personal because I wanted to show you, my dear viewer, the build that I intend to use on my first playthrough of the DLC. This character, the Alvinator, has everything that I need in order to tackle a fresh experience filled with unknown dangers. This is the build that will take me on a new adventure. Maybe I find out that other tools are needed and that some adaptation is required. Or maybe it turns out to be perfect and it makes everything easier. We will know when we get there. But until then, thank you very much for your time and I hope that I get to see you on the next one.